Okay, now we get into the final um, piece of the puzzle to understand delayed choice quantum eraser. In the previous videos, we understood, you know, the delayed choice. Uh, no, not well, not really. Well, so we understood a little bit about the delayed choice. We understood more about um, the double slit experiment because we went through the uh, Josephson, the Josephs, Josephson's junction. We went through how you know the. Um, idea of Copenhagen's interpretation, which includes the Heisenberg uncertain principle, which is very important. And now we're going to get into quantum entanglement. And, and this is what will help us understand the delayed choice quantum eraser, since it uses the quantum entanglement in conjunction with um, uncertainty principle. Quantum entanglement is, was basically a way for Einstein to try to prove the Copenhagen interpretation incorrect. And so Einstein came with this brilliant idea, a thought experiment, which has, has now actually been conducted and shown that Einstein was incorrect. Einstein was correct in his prediction of what would happen based on the mass. He was incorrect in saying it was impossible because it is possible is exactly what happens. Okay, that doesn't make sense yet unless you're familiar with quantum entanglement. First thing I want to do is, is talk about the states of particles. So you have z states, z axis measurements, which can be positive or negative. And I'm going I'm to represent them as images. So up and down spin, which will stand for positive and negative. Then you have x, the x-axis measurements. I'm going to represent them as this way, as left and right. I could just as easily represent them like this, right and left. Same difference, OK? I'm just using this, these symbols because they're easier to, to see and visualize than the actual you know numbers with positive and negatives or letters with positive and negatives next to them. So we have Alice over here, Bob, uh, the people in the middle, and Bob over here. Let's say for for sake of the experiment, Alice and Bob are eight seconds away in light years. So basically, the distance from the sun to the Earth. He's he's directly in the middle, four seconds away from both people. Okay, so before I get into Einstein's EPR paradox, I want to get into the measurement process here. If I send a particle to Bob and say measure it, and he's a measure on the z axis, let's say he measures it as up z, then I automatically know it's a down z too. Once I know it's up z, I know it also has a down z spin. You know, it has the opposites are true. The problem is once he takes a measurement of the z, the x becomes blurry. This, this, is an, this is the uncertainty principle, once again, another way, the and, and spins. These spins are so related, x and z axis, are so related, just like momentum and position. Once you measure the position, the momentum becomes distorted, and it becomes randomly distorted. Once you measure the, the position of z, x becomes randomly distorted. It, it, it's distorted, though, in such a way that it has a probability of being one of, you know, within this, you know, within that region, right? And so, uh, but with this, it's more of a 50-50, right? Because it only could be one or the other. It's either right or left, but it becomes distorted whether it's right or left. Okay, so this is the uncertainty principle in effect. But now let's get into quantum entanglement. So Einstein said, oh, wait a minute. If we entangle two photons, for example, and they, and they become entangled here at, at where the experiment's being conducted, we entangle the, the, the photons, just like in the double or the delayed choice quantum eraser. We like we can split them, or for example, take a photon and split it into two equal frequency photons. They become entangled. Once they become entangled, then they must have opposite polarity. So if this one has, uh, if this one has a plus z spin, then this one must have a negative z spin. And if this one has a, let's say, a right x spin, then this one must have a left x spin. So we send to, let's say, uh, Einstein said, well, what happens? This I'm basically I'm a I'm going to take Einstein's EPR paradox and, and make it make sense in a, in a more easier way. So I, the experimenter, I want to play a trick. And I decide, hey, I'm going to send Bob one of these entangled particles. And I'm going to tell Bob they're entangled. I'm going to say, Bob, tell me the z-axis. He, he measures it with great accuracy, and he tells me it has an upspin. I'm like, thank you, Bob. I send the entangled particle at, you know, at the same time to Alice, but I tell Alice not to take her measurement till a minute you know, a minute later. So I, I tell Bob, hey, take it at 7 o'clock. I tell her, take it at 7.01. So a minute later. Remember, that there, there's seven minutes across here anyway. That We'll get that in a second. I say, hey, Alice, now I know Bob has already given the, you know, Bob Bob has already taken the taken the uh, measurement. 
he sent me the information, which takes four seconds. And now I tell Alice to take the measurement at 701. She already knows that. She already knows to take a 701. He knows to take a 7. She knows to take a 701. She's, by the time I receive the information from Bob, she has already taken the measurement. Okay, what's important here is that by the time I receive her answer, her answer is, I don't know. I can't measure it. There's something really weird here. And if she's really smart, she'll think, you pulled a trick on me. You sent me an entangled particle, which has already been measured. Einstein said that was a contradiction. That, that that would be matter of fact Einstein said this scenario would be impossible so he tried to destroy Copenhagen's interpretation by pointing out this paradox saying you know if these particles are entangled and if Bob can know the Z position is up then you automatically instantaneously know that the A position of the, of the entangled particle must be down that is the Z must be down over here because it must be opposite polarities well wait a minute how can that be that means that means information. If the, if this is eight 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 seconds apart in light years, information is traveling faster than light. As a matter of fact, it's instantaneous. That is ex it, right when Bob takes the measurement and knows that this is in Z plus, you automatically know the other one must be Z down. It has to be that way. It can't be any other way. And that's the way it is. This is where Einstein was wrong. Einstein was correct in what would happen. He was incorrect. He was wrong in saying that it was impossible. Einstein said, nah, that's impossible, that can never happen, but it did happen, that's exactly what happened. Years later, the experiment was done, and this is what happens every single time. Once Bob makes his measurement, no matter how far the particles are apart, the other particle is always in the down position. And, that, that is, once, you, once Bob knows it is a positive Z, then immediately we know it's a negative Z, and when Alice takes her measurements on the, on the entangled particle, it is a negative Z. But when Alice tries to take a measurement of the X, she can't, and neither can Bob, due to the uncertainty principle. But quantum entanglement says that information is traveling faster than light. But how can that be? Well, remember before, when we went through this other explanation here, when you take a measurement, and once you take the measurement, you like collapse the waveform. And so remember with the, with the double slit experiment, that the electron leaves as a probability wave, a non-real thing. There's no electron there and there's no waves there. It's just a probability wave. It's calculations. Once it's detected, once it hits somewhere it's detected, then it exists in, like a particle and acts like a particle. Okay. That probability wave is important. Mathematical equations being done under the scene, as if they're being done under the Planck time, under the Planck length, where time and space don't exist. So if the calculations are being done underneath the Planck time. Now this is an explanation. This is going to explain the why. And probably maybe I shouldn't do that yet. Maybe I should leave that for the digital universe. But I'll just kind of briefly hit on it. If the if the uh, calculations are being done under Planck time, if the calculations are also making time and space exist for us, then there'd be no contradiction. It's not traveling. Nothing is traveling. No information is traveling. There's no there's no distance to travel because space doesn't exist underneath the Planck time and time doesn't exist underneath the Planck time. And so this calculation is happening always underneath reality. And so it's not traveling anywhere. It doesn't break any any rules. And voila. Okay. So now let's get into the double set, or the delayed choice quantum eraser, so that this makes sense. Remember the delayed choice quantum eraser. Let me go ahead and draw some things here really quick. Okay. So remember the delayed choice quantum eraser. Um, one thing interesting about it is the the uh, photon is shot and it's shot through a beam splitter and which splits the photon into two equal frequency uh, identical particles and these particles become entangled. One is considered the signal, it goes up here to D0. The other one, it bounces around off mirrors and and, uh, thing, and, and so I forgot the name of the crystals, but they allow 50-50 chance of the photon to pass through it or to bounce off of it. And they go to all these other detectors. What's important here, I'm not going to redraw the whole schematic, you can look at the other video for that, that is check out the delayed choice quantum eraser video that explains that experiment. And this helps understand the experiment. So because these are entangled, they have, you know, like the opposite effects. And since the, the experiment is to, uh, to to find the position, you already know the momentum. And since it's to find the position, then once you find the position, the momentum must, must change. In order for that to happen, the wave function must collapse. Because remember, the wave, remember, they exist as wave functions only. These photons are not real things. They exist as wave functions only. They only cease to exist as wave functions once you make a measurement and, and force them to be particles and to exist as particles and, to th and therefore act as particles. Then you destroy the wave function. But when you do that, you lose certain you, you lose certainty of certain things. So, if you know it's 
momentum, let's say, you can like predict this momentum, but you, you, then once you know its position and you say that's where it's at, it's right there right now, then the momentum becomes less certain. And if you know its momentum, then its position becomes less certain. And so just like the um, just like the double or excuse me the uh, yeah double slit experiment, the electron goes and it leaves existing as a wave function. It only exists as a wave function, which is a mathematical calculation, not a real thing. And only until you decide, or until you can measure the electron, does it exist to begin to exist as a particle and takes particle-like properties. And it's the very act of measuring it that collapses that wave function and makes it begin to exist and act like a particle. The same thing happens in the delayed choice quantum eraser. The only difference is you're dealing with entanglement. So you have two entangled particles, right? And this this experiment reduces the, the idea that, hey, somehow the detectors themselves are what are what's causing this collapse. It shows it's not the detectors themselves that's causing this collapse, it's the whole entire experiment itself that's causing the collapse. It's the it's the contradict it's trying to contradict the uncertainty principle. That is, if we got any other results, logical results from the delayed choice quantum eraser, then guess what happened? we would contradict the uncertainty principle. The uncertainty principle is an absolute must be. This should also make another question in mind. Why must it be? Why does that rule exist in the universe? Why is, why, what's the purpose behind it for there to be this randomization, this, because in order for the delay, the um, uncertainty principle allows for true randomness in the universe. Why must true randomness in the universe exist? What's the purpose of that? Why can't the whole universe be uniform and predictory as Einstein wanted it to be? Like, you know, why can't predestination be true, basically? Uh, why can't determinism be true? And it shows that determinism is not true, that there is true random things in the universe, but why are, why is it that way? And that's what I like to get into my philosophy, and my understanding of the universe, and we'll, we're going to kind of get into digital physics. And digital physics shows, and it, it uses, it just basically looks, looks at the observations. Anyway, I don't have time to get into that. I'll get into that next. We'll get into digital physics, digital philosophy, and um, it's very strange, very weird, uh, but you know, kind of like we're living in a matrix or something. But I have a, my own philosophy that makes sense of it in a certain way that it's like, ah, oh, it's not really like the Matrix. It, it, it's, it's very similar as far as being a digital universe, so to speak, or, or very similar to digital, but it's different in such a way, my philosophy is different in such a way that it leaves one, I think, feeling more satisfied and it makes more sense because we're not being programmed by something. In other words, it doesn't leave the other explanation, okay, if we are in a digital universe, we are in a Matrix, who made it? Where do they come from? And, and then it doesn't solve anything. Then we're right back where we started. My philosophy gets rid of all that. It's one full, complete philosophy that doesn't leave you with questions like that. Okay, so hopefully the double slit experiment and delayed choice conservation makes more sense now as far as how physicists understand it. That's the understanding. It has to do with uncertainty principle and all the things I talked about. I don't want to go and repeat it all. If you have any questions, please leave comments. I'd, I'd be willing to, more than willing to answer your questions for you and to have conversations with you. And hey, if you even want to just debate it for a while, we can do that on PalTalk. Um, so that's cool. Okay. I'll come back with more videos with my philosophy trying to explain the whys behind this. This shows how and all that. It does, it does, it does show some whys, but it, it, it raises more questions that are not answered. And that is, why is there this randomness? Why or how and why is this information able to travel? Or even though it's not really traveling, you know, how is... The, when, during the quantum entanglement, how can both particles automatically, instantaneously have these things when quantum mechanics is true and Einstein was incorrect? There's not some hidden variable. How can that be true? How can that be possible? And I kind of briefly hinted on it. Well, it could be possible if there was a mathematical equation type of thing, some sort of algorithm happening under Planck time. And that same algorithm or all that same mathematicalness of the universe is existing outside time and space. Time and space is also the product of that. Anyway, that, that's where we get into digital physics and that's what I'll be doing next. Alright, thank you for watching.